everybody. Here's what's happening. Life with Osama bin Laden. And McDonald's sponsoring the Pope. In other news, a California recall election. Global war on terrorism. Flush the toilet. The attacks. The Patriot Act has not affected their civil rights. Osama's former mistress talks to Rita in a big story exclusive. Aren't you sick of all that? Hear my voice. Escuta minha voz. Nivelle. Écoutez moi, mon vieux. Oye, mi voz. Become an apprentice at KPFA. This is an affirmative action program designed to teach production skills and provide media access to our communities. Call 510-848-6767, extension 235, to apply. Give voice to your vision. It's your world, too. The application deadline is 5 p.m. Friday, January 29th, 2010. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It's 1 o'clock. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. <laughs> Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hello, I'm Michelle Chen, and you're tuned to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. On today's show, we will be talking about Point Malate. As some of you know, the future of Point Malate, which is uh, located just north of the Richmond Bridge, is at a crossroads. This area has outstanding natural values, but they may, may be under threat by the construction of a massive Las Vegas-style casino. So what is the future of Point Malate, and what are the visions of sustainable development in Richmond? We'll discuss that in the next half hour with Lech Namovich. He is the conservation analyst for the East Bay chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And on the second half of the show, we'll be joined by Carol Telshik fall She's a Richmond resident who serves on the city's planning commission and who was formerly a member of the Richmond General Plan Advisory Committee. Welcome to Terra Verde, Lech. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, tell us a little bit about Point Malate. Um, where is it and why is it so unique? Well, Point Malati is maybe the least known gem of the East Bay. Um, it's a really, as you look at a map and you lay out a map of the East Bay, you'll find that there is a, a, a set of mountains that pop up on the western end of Richmond, and those are completely disconnected from the East Bay Hills. And what's happened here is this is a portion of the Portrero Hills that stretch all the way up into um, Northern California. And so not the Portrero Hill in San Francisco, but a separate kind of set of what mountain ranges? Exactly. It's a separate uh, geological formation, and it has a unique um, substrate which uh, brings about plants that are typically thought of as Marin or Northern California species. Um, we have our little taste of this uh, North Bay right there on Point Malati. So, right, and so, isn't this section in Point Malati actually kind of more connected in with the Marin Headlands and stuff like that? And, and it was what separated by glaciers, or how, how? What what happened there? Absolutely. So, what was what once happened is that this section was connected overland to Marin and upwards into Mendocino County. Um, since then, the bay or the estuary has developed, which is the West Coast's largest estuary. We tend to call it the bay. Um, and so that separated this. So this has actually become an island. Um, it's a terrestrial island, if you will, uh, separated from the mainland. And um, it's ha it has a number of residents of plants and animals, um, namely plants, that you'll only find uh, north of the East Bay. Right. So these are considered remnant populations, right? Exactly, and even from a, a unique climate change pers perspective, we think of this as a range limit. And so these are the types of plants that we're really watching closely in research, wondering what's going to happen to the southernmost or northernmost or easternmost or westernmost population. So Point Malati has a number of those plants that we'd really like to keep our eyes on. Tell us a little bit more about these like, really particular species that you really won't well, will you find them in other places? Is it has it is it you know that special that you just can't find them in other places, or is it just like 
you know, tell, tell us about mm-hmm. tell us about that. Well, it's 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 a very good question because. Um, we believe there are very unique populations there that are found further north. But what we find in the East Bay has been separated from what's north of there um, for many, many um, tens of thousands of years since the bay has developed. And so we believe there's a chance that some of the plants there have actually speciated since they've um, been separated. There hasn't been a whole lot of research on that. That's very anecdotal. But at the same time, um, we know that uh, when you tend to remove one population from a larger population, that um, genes tend to move around. They tend to go in a certain direction. So we have a number of plants there. For instance, there's this wonderful plant that's very reminiscent of the of a desert flora. It, it has succulent leaves that are filled with fresh water, and it's called sea lettuce, or Dudley of Farinosa. That plant is found on Point Melati which, and um, down through the uh, Point Richmond on that peninsula, San Pablo Peninsula, and it isn't found anywhere else. We have have a point melati fescue grass it's a red fescue grass and the interesting story about this is that this grass is not um has now been used for uh horticulture and it is the source of the grass because um landscape architects love it so much it has uh sometimes has this bluish hue to it and um it really is a wonderful plant on top of that there's a, a unique riparian plant um that likes wetter areas that's called dutchman's pipe vine and the flower sounds exactly as you'd expect. It's a, uh, it's to me, it almost looks more like a saxophone. But it's a vine. Um, it's a vine that flowers and and forms a kind of pipe. And in there, you have a special type of uh, swallowtail that um, butterfly. Yeah, swallowtail butterfly that pollinates it. And so you have all these unique plants that are um, otherwise found in very high concentrations further north of us. But this is our little taste of them here in the East Bay. Right. Right. Well. You know, Point Malate, as you said, is this kind of unknown gem. I mean, people that have lived in the East Bay for a long time, people have lived in Richmond for a long time, have never really gone to this area. I mean, it's kind of stuck up north of the San Rafael Bridge, kind of stuck in amidst the refinery and everything like that. I mean, paint us a picture. I mean, if, if someone were, some intrepid sort of hiker were to go out to Point Malate, what would they say? Well, we would we would really benefit from having more people visit the site. Right now, the site is fenced off because it's been transferred from the Navy to the city of Richmond, and um, there are some sites there that are of uh, that are contaminated. So I'm not I'm certainly not asking people to go out there, but I'll, I will paint you a picture since I've had the fortune to be out there recently. This and morning. This morning, maybe. <laughs> um, What's really unique about Point Malati is that the entire ridge to shoreline is intact in certain watersheds. So you will see entire watersheds that from top have sprawling toy on trees or Christmas berries. Um, and then uh, you'll find patches of coastal prairie, native coastal prairie grasslands that um, there's probably about 5% left in California from um, what there once was. Uh, you find uh, shrublands filled with um, also Christmas berry, coyote brush, lots of birds. In between those shrublands and the drainages, you find willows. The willows are a beautiful hue of gold right now. And, and so you have this sinuous uh, uh, stream of golden trees coming down. They come through cliffs where you have coastal strand communities and then down into, in some cases, a sandy shore and eventually into the eelgrass beds. And um, and one of the most fantastic resources of this area is the fact that there is this is one of the largest populations of eelgrass beds still remaining in the San Francisco Bay. Yeah, and eelgrass is really important for um, shellfish populations and other. I mean, what's what's so special about eelgrass? Well, to to be blunt about it, everything. Eelgrass is really a keystone species, and um, it's found to be very important for the fish there. Um, it's found to be very important for uh, the microorganisms that are there, um, the birds then that use the fish, the people. 
um, the Richmond fisher folks, fishermen, fisherwomen, as they go out there, they talk about these eelgrass beds. That's where you get the good stuff. Right. And so um, just as humans have latched on to that value, um, naturally it has a lot of value for that. And then, of course, um, eelgrass is really important for uh, global warming. And so they found that um, eelgrass is actually uh, a really strong, uh, has a really high affinity to, to fixing uh, carbon dioxide. And so the productivity of those, and, and it kind of serves as a buffer for global warming and, and climate change. So, Right. Well, I mean, it sounds amazing that you describe this area that is, you know, in some places almost pristine. And yet, you know, you've got this giant refinery. It's been there for 100 years. I mean, it, as you mentioned, I mean, they, there used to be a naval um, fueling, you know, depot there. And, you know, that's you know, obviously had some contamination, you know, effects. And there actually used to be a vineyard, you know. How is it possible that all of these different pressures were put on this area and yet somehow, you know, you, you still describe it as a place of outstanding natural value? Really good question. I think there are a couple of things that are going on here. Number one is the fact that I believe this area is the East Bay's Marin Headlands. Um, and just as when you're hiking in the Marin Headlands, you turn a corner and a whole new world opens up. Very similar to Point Malati. You turn a corner and wow, there's a drainage, an area you've never seen. Wow, look at those plants that you'd never seen before. Um, and so that's one unique aspect. Number two, it's the, the substrate, the geology. There's something really unique there that the native plants are very resilient. They hold on to uh, the soils really well. Um, although there are some invasive species, those are only where there's been heavy land movement. And so there's something really unique um, about the affinity of the plants for the soils that are there. In terms of the past human uses, um, the uh, winery, which is a historic building or complex of historic buildings, and the fuels depot, um, there has been a certain amount of grading. So you can't imagine that it's as pristine as some sites, but um, we believe that there's a historical character there that is uh, that fits well into this landscape. Um, uh, the winery has sort of this medieval feel. It's a red brick building that kind of uh, lashes out against the uh, uh, backdrop of the hills. So, um, but yet it has this character to it that um, states, uh, come, come see what I have to offer. And so there are a number of these buildings and a number of these resources that really make it unique. Um, the Navy has done some land movement, but we believe and we firmly believe that this, if there is a place where we think restoration um, can occur and be successful, um, we think this is a good site for that. This is Tara Verde on 94.1 KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. We're talking about Point Malate with Lek Namovich of the California Native Plant Society. And we'll now turn to the issue of, well, the proposed Point Malate Casino. And joining us on the phone is Carol Telchik Fall. She's a Richmond resident who serves on the city's planning commission, and she was also formerly a member of the Richmond General Plan Advisory Committee. Welcome to Tara Verde, Carol. Hello, Michelle Lek. Well, obviously, Lick has been describing for us this you know, this amazing parcel of land. Um, you know, its natural beauty, the fact I mean, it has beautiful, beautiful views to the marine headlands and the bridge and the city and the bay. Um, you know, people have got to be pretty attracted to it. And so there is this proposal for a casino. Um, tell us, Carol, a little bit more about the casino. Who's developing it? How big would it be? What would it entail? Yes, the, uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, the site is really beautiful and how I first um, really became involved in all of this was that I went for a hike out there and I was just taken by how peaceful you feel when you're only just moments away from the city and, you know, everything that's around it. So thank you, Lek, for a good description of the site. Um, what is proposed uh, to be built out there is a... Uh, a high density casino complex. Um, the developers are, um, their name is Upstream, and they are hoping to partner with um, a tribe so that they can have the um, approval to transfer the, the land into tribal sovereignty and build a casino. The, it's actually a complex uh, composed of many different elements. 
there will be 240,000 square feet of casino gambling area. There will be up to 3,000 slot machines, uh, 300,000 square feet of shopping center, two hotels with over a 1,000 rooms, 170,000 square feet of business space, and two parking garages, one of which will have to be kind of hacked out into a hillside uh, to accommodate 7,500 cars. They will generate about 13 tons of solid waste per day. They'll require between 460 and 730 gallons of water per day. And the traffic impacts will be significant, to say the least. Um, they are estimating 22,000 trips per day. Um, so all of these things, um, in my opinion, make it an inappropriate high-density development that's inappropriate to sensitive shoreline area and will totally ruin the overall um, feeling of the place in addition to all of the environmental um, impacts that it will have as well as the impacts on traffic and just surrounding quality of life. Right. Well, I mean, tell us a little bit more. I mean, obviously, the developer is really for um, for this proposed casino, but I mean, who who else who who in Richmond are lining up for it, and who is lining up against it? I mean, and what are what are the reasons why people want it? Well, we historically, and this has been going on for quite a few years now, um, at least five. Um, people are, are are very strongly split over over it. the people who want the casino see it as a. They mainly see it as a job generator, and they see it as a tax revenue generator. And they, um, the the developer has made a variety of promises um, that you know a lot of people will be pulled up out of the out of a jobless situation, and that um, you know this is a good way to get uh, revenues. Um, oftentimes, we've been compared to the city of San Pablo, which I don't think is a really great comparison because uh, I would rather see us comparing ourselves to not the, the poorest city in Contra Costa County. San Pablo does have a casino, and, the, and yet they've had it for over eight years, and they remain the poorest city in the county. Um, but so, the, but mainly the people, the reason that people want it is because they believe very strongly that there will be economic development. Um, and then the people who oppose it um, really believe that we do need jobs and we do need development, but that um, we are building a new vision of Richmond and we feel that we can have um, a better form of development, more of a moderate um, kind of plan that will bring long-term growth and sustainable growth rather than um, a short-term gain and then long-term problems. Right, and we'll we'll definitely get to that question of, you know, what is the alternative vision for Richmond, if not, you know, sorry for Point Malati, if Mm -hmm. not for this later in the show. But, um, you know, one of the things which the developers are saying is that, you know, they, on the environmental side, for at least, this is supposed to be a real eco Development, you know, they're, they they say, okay, you know, we're going to have you know all the solar, and we're going to try to stay within the existing footprint, and you know, and not get you know, um, I mean, like what I mean, what are some of the you know some of your responses to that? Because I know that um, your organization, for example, you know, did a public um, submitted public comment to the to the big environmental impact impact review of the casino. So, what's your take? Well, we do applaud uh, the developer for taking some measures, but um, let's be very careful uh, about analyzing what's going on here. Number one, it will be solar, but um, when you look at the amount of light consumption that goes on and an energy consumption that goes on in a casino, well, it better be at least solar, and you'd probably need solar panels to cover um, five-point melodies to make up for the energy use. And so you have to be very careful careful in in some of these statements. Are they doing something good? Yes. Is it going to mitigate the amount of impact they're producing? Not a chance. Right. And and Carol, I mean, back to you. I mean, there is other, you know, there there are other things that the developers are are saying with respect to, you know, the kinds of, you know, the kinds of and the quality of jobs that they're bringing. Yes. Um, that is a, a very big uh, element of the whole uh, dispute. They 
are promising jobs, and in the uh, draft EIR EIS document that the Planning Commission has already reviewed and commented upon, um, they they estimate the number of jobs to be seventeen thousand, but they when you look at it, the figures are all based on predictive models and these models are I mean I never saw anything in there that showed an actual breakdown of the job types the salary ranges the job stability or the benefits and if you look at other cities who have real casinos with the jobs that actually are being held down at real casinos uh, you know I just don't really see where it can measure up and I didn't see what I would call a true economic analysis in the document. So um, I, as well as many other people in the city and, and city leaders, um, question that the promises of jobs can actually come true. Right. Well, and there is also, I think, a lot of people who are concerned about the fact that it's a casino. And, that, yeah. That's right. So you have jobs that are based on casinos, whereas if you had a more moderate uh, type of development that was centered around sustainable recreational um, type things, you could have what we call green collar jobs and that do come with much more of a future. There are jobs that you can build upon. They're great entry level jobs. They're, you know, I mean, there are a lot of different um models for that 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 people are proposing and one comment i wanted to make really quickly is that i believe that past behavior is the best indicator for future action and um the de- the developer in this case probably has spent uh at somewhere in the range of a million dollars maybe much more on this eir and this planning process we have not seen a single consultant that's come out of richmond yet richmond has capable consultants that the city talks about and so um actually the main consulting firms out of sacramento um a hundred plus miles away and so we wonder why not start by making a commitment by hiring local people to do the planning to do the analysis to do the work and so um that seems to be another shortfall in this process Mm -hmm. well and the other thing i wanted to make sure that we covered and carol is that i mean this development as is at a really critical juncture, isn't it? Yes, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of. Di- it's a very complex project, and there are a lot of different um, things that are going on on a few different tracks. Um, I can just kind of quickly bring you up to date on on what the major milestones are right now. Um, first of all, on January the fifteenth, the developers uh, contract with the city. It's called the LDA Land Disposition Agreement. That runs out on January the fifteenth. That contract basically is um, an agreement for the city to be in exclusive negotiations with these particular developers and not be talking about other possible plans with other developers. So uh, that's going to run out soon, at which point the city could begin to entertain offers from other developers. Um, we also have the, the a milestone that we're waiting for BIA approval of whether or not the land can legally be transferred for tribal use. And that's Bureau of Indian Affairs. Yes, that's right. And uh, without their approval, the 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 whole casino plan really is is not going to fly. They can still upstream can still purchase the land, but at that point they wouldn't be able to follow through on the casino complex that they have planned because it would uh, be illegal. So wait, and then and then there's the confusion about whether or not the city council is going to vote to approve the EIR EIS without hearing whether or not the BIA is going to approve. A lot of people think that it's a little bit crazy to even think about it without knowing what the BIA decision is going to be. So there's 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 some there's 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 just a discussion and disagreement going on there. And then the final thing to remember is that. There is a cleanup going on out there because the pro- the land was most recently owned by the Navy and it was u- used as a fuel depot. The Navy is doing the cleanup. Um, they are required to do the cleanup and it is 85% complete. Um, that was the last percentage. So it's, it's, it's almost complete, but there are still some areas that have to be finished. So that's going on. There's been some controversial um, things over whether or not to try to fast track that cleanup and whether it's a good idea to fast track it or a bad idea. So a lot of complicated 
milestones, but that really is where we are. Um, there are a lot of things yet to to happen and to be decided, and I just want to make clear that the land has not been transferred to upstream. The land has been transferred to the city, and at this point, the city is the legal owner of the land. Right. So in the last couple of minutes, I, uh, I wanted to really give you a chance, Carol, to talk about, well, you know, for, for for people like you who believe that the future of Point Malate should look very different, I mean, what is your alternative vision? Well, there's an alternative vision that's based on a moderate development because we do still want to have some economic generation, but we're looking at something that would fit more in with the with the spirit of the place and the natural setting and the environment out there. Um, there's a lot of great ideas. Uh, we would want to limit uh, development to the existing footprints or restore the historic buildings. The castle, as I call it, that, that large building that Lech described for us, could become a convention center similar to the one at Asilomar or Cavallo Point Lodge in San Francisco. The cottages could become bed and breakfast. Uh, some people have said they'd like to see a campground out there because we have Little Brother Island out there, which is kind of a very high-end bed and breakfast, so we could try to get some more moderate-priced um, things out there. Uh, we would open up the beaches to fishing, kayaking, hiking. We could have community gardens. We could have restaurants, summer camps. There's a huge market for summer camps for children. Um, we could have educational and art programs there, perhaps even an artist work center similar to what they have in San Francisco. I mean, there are just a lot of exciting um, opportunities that we could put together, but how I like to, to call it is that it would be a recreational node centered around healthy recreation um, for the citizens of Richmond to enjoy, but also the entire Bay Area. Well, that that does sound that does sound like quite a vision indeed. Well, we are just about at the end of our time, and so, Lek, I particularly wanted to give you this opportunity to give out some resources to um, listeners who might want to find out more about Point Malate, about the casino development, um, about the natural values of the area. So, if you have some websites and phone numbers you want to give out, that'd be great. Absolutely. First of all, I'd like to recommend this dynamite uh, group of uh, rich residents, uh, volunteers. Um, it's completely volunteer-run group. It's called the Coalition for Sustainable Point Malati. And the website is uh, www.cfspm.org. So it's Coalition for Sustainable Point Malati, the first letter of each of those. And uh, you'll find a whole lot of information on those sites. You'll find a way to um, connect with people that are uh, really passionate about this and passionate about um, seeing something uh, better for Richmond, not just buying off on the first offer that comes, but actually taking this, taking the time to plan something that makes sense for a community um, such as Richmond. So um, as for the East Bay chapter of California Native Plant Society, um, you can find our uh, information at www.ebcnps. Dot org. So that's eastbaycnps.org. Um, and then also you'll find our comment letter. Uh, you'll find a link from the conservation um, page on that. Uh, on that website to our comment letter. We wrote uh, about a 55-page comment letter on this, and um, we're certainly very concerned about this. So, again, um, those websites, Coalition for Sustainable Point Malate, um, www.cfspm.org. The East Bay chapter of the California Native Plant Society is ebscnps.org. Thanks so much to Leck and Carol for joining us and to Erica Bridgman, our engineer. You can listen to archives of this show and others on kpfa.org. We hope you join us next week. Have a great weekend. Airtime continues to explore the treasure trove of Bay Area artists like John Handy, Faye Carroll, and Ed Kelly, who have invested their hearts and souls in this community. 
We also span the globe to bring you the recorded music of and conversations with established jazz innovators, rising young stars, and or prodigious sons and daughters of the Bay Area, such as Craig Handy in the background. Airtime is not defined by the form of the message, but by its vitality. So whenever the contributor is dealing with film, Latin jazz, blues, or gospel, expect to hear them every Saturday night from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. on KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, and KFCF in 